Welcome to this, um, to this talk. I hope um, all your wounds are closed by now. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different. Um, I'll keep it light, but I want to talk about OpenMP. It's one of my, uh, my passions. And I gave it this sort of, a, I think, challenging title. So here's my, uh, my agenda. I'll try to um, get it all done in half an hour, which probably will fail. Um, but I wanted to leave uh, five minutes for, I always find it funny that people call it Q&A, as if you have the answer to every possible question asked. So I always say Q and some A. It'll depend on your question and, and whether I have anything sensible to say about it. So let's see, let's get started. A um, little bit of show of hands. I'll promise you not to ask any, any other questions to the audience. I hate it when that happens, just when I'm checking my email or about to doze off for the third time that day, then I get a question asked. But just curious, who's familiar with OpenMP in the sense that you kind of know a bit about it? Just a few. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I will. I, I, I conveniently ignored all the emails that Nicholas has been sending me. So I am going to do a little bit of education um, because I thought I'll be talking about OpenMP. So let me give you a world's um, quickest introduction into OpenMP. Um, it's a bit of an elephant in the room that many have an opinion about it, not necessarily backed up by facts, but that's not exclusive to, uh, to OpenMP. And I'm going to really give you a, some sort of a feel for what OpenMP is about in a few minutes, which hopefully will work. First of all, um, it's still on the rise, which is amazing given how old it is. So uh, once in a while we have a, a new company signing up to support it. Uh, this is all on the openmp.org web, website. You can go there, very impressive names. And um, as I said, it's rising, so that's really good. So it's very widely supported. What is it? It's a shared memory parallel programming model for C, C++, and Fortran. And you can use that to multi-thread your application and in that way, you can exploit the hardware uh, parallelism that your system hopefully has. And that could be a multi-core system. A uh, bit of selling mode. I always say I get 10% of a free license, so I make, uh, make tons of money by showing a slide like this. Um, why OpenMP? Well, it turns out that OpenMP has evolved quite, quite well to keep up with modern architectures. Its strength is the portability. You take your OpenMP program, you can run it across quite a, quite a variety of systems. Um, and another nice thing is, although that's kind of changing the memory and threading model sort of used to map quite naturally on the hardware, that has changed somewhat, and I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Um, there is a good integration between the host and accelerator, so you can, you can stay within your conventional OpenMP environment and start using an accelerator that you may have access to. It's fairly lightweight if you use it in the right way. I mean, you write dumb code, you get dumb performance, but um, it is not that heavy. Uh, and as I said, it continues to evolve, and that's thanks to a very active language committee that uh, really tries to keep up with hardware trends. And as I said, support is still on the rise. So for a long time, a really long time, this was OpenMP's world. And what it was, there was a pool of shared memory. You had a bunch of threads. And each thread had also access to its private memory. And the reason it was called private, because that thread would only be able to access its own private memory. The shared memory was accessible to all threads. So a very simple uh, memory model, but it worked well, because the architectures were pretty much like that. But then um, architecture started to change. You started to have accelerators. The size of the uh, system was growing. And now this is the sort of thing that OpenMP can control. You can control OpenMP on this kind of um, it's fairly distributed shared system. Um, so you have accelerators, you have clusters of SMPs connected through a shared memory interconnect. And um, that's, that's currently um, in OpenMP. Uh, if you're interested in OpenMP, go to uh, www.openmp.org. Um, you can get the specs there, the 5.2 specs. Um, it's a whopping 669 pages. It came a long way from the original 50 pages in Wondodo. Um, I won't say much more on that, especially since I'm on the camera. Um, but um, it's quite a volume. Um, but again, yeah, that's the way it is. So this is the current memory model in OpenMP. And um, it's, it's more complex, but it, it fits the, the hardware better. So you still have your shared memory, you have your private memory, but you also have an accelerator. 
And depending on the architecture of that accelerator, you have a more complex memory architecture behind that as well. Again, a thread can, um, can only see its own private memory. And there's good reasons why you want to have that. And shared memory is accessible by all threads. They can modify data anytime they want. They can read it anytime they want. And it's up to you to make it right. Happen, that happens in the right way. And you, knew, you need both types of memory. And then, of course, you have your accelerator memory where you offload your computations to. So that's the current OpenMP memory model. And um, that's also the biggest learning curve when you're new to OpenMP. Because all of a sudden, you have to think about your data structures in terms of should that be shared or should that be private. And it's one of the, one of the harder parts of learning the language, because that was not something you had to think about before. Um, so that's a new element. And uh, um, again, shared variables are accessible by all threads. They can all read and write those shared variables at any time that they like. Um, private is different. You can only see it. There's a, another catch here. And I'll, I'll be going back to that um, in a minute. Um, private data is not initialized by default. It's, um, it's the way it is. So what do you get when you get OpenMP? You get an API to define and control the parallelism. You get a runtime library to, um, to ask how many threads you have. You can change certain behavior. Um, you can do all sorts of things with that API. Uh, and the runtime library, and you get a set of environment variables to, to control things at startup time, for example, the number of threads. All right. So how does OpenMP work? You take your sequential code, and you add OpenMP to it. You add the OpenMP controls. They have the syntax of a language comment in Fortran and a pragma in C, so you don't lose portability in a way. You still have your sequential code built in um, so you add that to your code. You take a compiler that understands OpenMP, so you have to typically have to enable the recognition of the OpenMP controls. That will give you a parallel executable. And you run that program, and as you run it, those environment variables are read at startup, and you have the runtime library to do some magic while the program is executing. So that's how OpenMP, in a very simplified way, works. And now I want to do a demo, which is always to the fun of the audience. Uh, we will see how far I get. I've tried to prepare it. Let me get out of this. And there was a little thing that I wanted to point out. Who is Drew in this room? Whose name is Drew? Because we're using his iPhone. Um, <laughs> my prompt has the host name, and the host name is Drew's iPhone. <laughs> I didn't make that up. <laughs> So I got a little tad worried when I saw that for the first time, and I'm not sure what I still should be worried, but we're all using Drew's iPhone. I guess uh, he doesn't talk a lot. So I'm going to set up a connection to our, um, to our cloud environment. And um, I have prepared a very simple program. All right. Hello, world. But of course, I, um, I know Nicholas. I think he will like this. Of course, this is multi-core world. So we're going to change that. Okay. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm a really bad typer, but I didn't want to. Didn't want to prepare this. I just want to type it in live. So this is my uh, this is my sequential program, the printf statement. I'm going to use GCC. Sorry, Jeff. No, no LLVM. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to compile it. All right. And I run it. And this is what we expect. So that's my sequential program. Now, now I'm going to add OpenMP to it. So what I need to do, I need to, add, to use a pragma. And let me not make a typo. Pragma, and the keyword is OMP. Uh, other people sometimes type in OpenMP. Of course, never happens to me. It's OMP what you type in there. And you say parallel, because I want to have this executed in parallel. And I have to tell it where the, where the parallelism starts and ends. And I have to change that one. And that should be my new parallel program. Now, one of those beginner's things is I compile again. OK. I run it. And no parallelism, because I didn't tell the compiler this is OpenMP. So on GCC, that's the um, dash o f OpenMP option. Okay. okay, I run it, 
Now it, has, now it has recognized that pragma. So under the hood, a lot of things happen. Compiler has recognized that pragma, translated to a whole bunch of internal library calls to implement the parallelism for me. And it doesn't run in parallel. That's great, because I need to set the number of threads. I'm using a single core system here. Okay. So I'm going to, again, make Nicholas very happy. We'll, we'll, we'll get the whole world shouting. Hello, multi-core world. So that's as easy as it is to use OpenMP. It's actually not where the problems are. The problem is, is finding the parallelism and getting it right. And that's what I, I want to talk about now. So this hopefully gives you some sort of a feel for what OpenMP is about and that the, the, the basics are pretty easy. So this is the talk that I really wanted to give. But again, I wanted to give you a feel for OpenMP. So the title, what could possibly go wrong? Nothing, of course. That's, so that would be a really short talk for this multi-core world. It, it would be a great panel session, by the way, Nicholas, <laughs> to talk about nothing. Um, maybe, maybe we got to refine that a little bit. So where could things go wrong? And um, this is like a, almost like a tutorial kind of thing, but I also want to show people why is it so hard to do that multi-threading? Everybody talks about multi-threading. And why can't you just sprinkle some stuff over it and just have it happen? It's, it's actually... No, not, not that trivial. And you, you have two areas where things can go wrong. First of all, uh, you, you don't get the right result. Well, that's a showstopper. You've got to fix that. You've got to find and fix that. And then there's performance. And I've given zillions of talks on performance, not today, but there are many of those. Um, today, I'm going to focus on correctness, because that's step number one. Um, again, um, that's what I'll do. So, this is the, the big picture. It's a little bit refined from what I just showed a few minutes ago. You start with the code. You use OpenMP. You add OpenMP to it, as it, you just saw me doing with that little demo. You compile, and you have to typically enable OpenMP recognition in the compiler. By the way, I didn't show that. But what it basically showed was that I preserved the sequential semantics because I didn't compile with dash of OpenMP, I still have my sequential code. It's one of those nice things when you're testing and developing. I get my OpenMP executable and my runtime library, and there we go, we start executing. So where could things go wrong? Well, the runtime library could have a bug. It's not very likely, it's quite unlikely, actually, that there's a bug there. Um, the compiler could have a bug. I mean, can happen, brand new feature, maybe they didn't get it right from day one. But actually, by far, it's actually the people sitting here that make the mistakes. That's, that's, that's why it's so hard, because you make those mistakes and, and you fall into a trap without even realizing it. So what I'm going to show you may seem crafted, but they're all taken from real applications, of course, stripped down to the bare essentials. But those are things that I found in real user codes. And the top three um, kind of sounds so obvious, but whatever you try to parallelize wasn't parallel. And you just jammed in that pragma, and OpenMP is very prescriptive, unlike OpenWound, of course. And um, it will just do the parallelization. Or you, you got that stuff about shared and private wrong. That's a, another common, common mistake. Or you introduce what's called a data race. So let me, let me elaborate on that. Here's a, a little loop, and it's typically optimized for sequential performance with a not too smart compiler. So you, this is what you typically find in, in kind of older codes or new codes. Um, so I'm, I'm computing A of I and I'm using the previous value of, of, of A, A of I minus one, but I, I sort of mask that a bit. But what I have here is a notion of time in my loop. And if you have a notion of time, then you can't parallelize it because what this thing says is that before I compute A of I, I should have computed A of I minus 1. So it can't do things at the same time, so there's no parallelism. Okay. If you write it a little, little clearer, it's the dependence is clearer, A of I depends on A of I minus 1. So this is not independent, I can't parallelize that loop. Well, the beauty of OpenMP is you can. And I just want to show you how that manifests itself I told the system, this is a parallel for loop, and I, I told the compiler, just parallelize it, stop thinking, do it. And now you see that uh, the scary thing is three results are actually correct in my little loop of 10 long, and, um, and seven are, are wrong. And um, that's the typical behavior that you get. 
Now, if this is deeply buried in your code, I can tell you it takes a while to find it. But it, it all starts with the basics. Uh, if I take the, the different formulation, it's kind of interesting. I get wrong, wrong results. I get wrong results, but they're different than the other wrong results that I had. So it's, it's highly, uh, highly determined what happens at runtime, what you get. And in this case, five results out of the 10 are OK, and five are wrong. So this is why I'm saying when you parallelize code incorrectly, you may get wrong results. And in the worst case, actually, sometimes they're OK. That's, that's really a nightmare to, uh, to debug. This is why we're so much hammering on tools that help you to find these kind of things. Um, a little trick, old hacker's trick. If it's a loop and you, you're not sure, you run the iterations backward. If you, if you get the wrong result, you know it's not parallel, because then there's a notion of ordering in it. If you get the right result, you still don't know. You, so it only works one way. But it's a little quick trick. If it's a complicated code you don't know, you're not familiar with, yeah, it's worth a try. Um, well, this is a little bit of my hobby horse. Um, uh, some tips. First of all, um, don't parallelize what doesn't matter, so you don't have to think about things that don't matter in terms of performance or use a profiling tool. Um, if, if you find something that takes a lot of time, see if somebody else wrote a parallel algorithm for you. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel necessarily and chances are somebody else who did the work already. Um, in some cases, um, you've got to be efficient on, you've always got to be efficient on a single thread. Uh, sometimes you can isolate a sequential part out of the parallel work and deal with, deal with that separately. Um, and when doing so, you've got to be careful about extra memory traffic. So this is not as trivial as I'm sort of just sketched it. It could be quite a work to, um, to do, but definitely you've got to do it. Another classical example is where you, you mess up with this scoping, the shared and private. Um, in the previous example, I, I already I made another mistake. I, that previous value, by the virtue of the default rules of OpenMP, is a shared variable. And that's not allowed. That's, that'll, that's undefined. So let me show you. Um, I have a... Um, private variable here, so I should not have made var um, shared. Here I have another case. I have a private variable, this time my var, and all I do is I add that to some other vector to get my new vector, and that value is initialized to 10. That seems very, fairly innocent. Well, there's this nasty rule in OpenMP that private variables are not defined on entry and exit to the parallel region. So the value of 10 that you think may be there isn't there, because that's the other rule that overrides it. So my var is actually undefined here. And, um, and even if it works today because of your compiler behavior, it may not work tomorrow. Um, the OpenMP has a solution for that. It's called first private. That will pre-initialize that value in, to all the threads, so they all get the initial value of 10. So there are ways around it. But one of, what I want to kind of get across is these are very subtle errors you have in your OpenMP, and, and they can be really nasty to, uh, to find. But luckily, in this case, OpenMP has the solution. So with that scoping, there's some simple rules. Um, don't rely on the, on, the, on the default rules. They're fairly subtle. Um, Use local variables in your code block in your C, C++, uh, Fortran if you can. They're automatically private, and that relieves you of a lot of uh, potential bugs. And think about all these other variables yourself. Um, don't re again, don't rely. These rules are fairly tricky, and it's good, good practice to think about those variables. Should they be shared? Should they be private? And it may seem hard, but once you get the hang of it, it's actually not that difficult. And certainly helps you um, avoiding a lot of bugs. It's probably the most common case why OpenMP programs produce a wrong answer. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about is uh, data races. What is a data race? A data race happens, and you have to have all these three conditions. You have multiple threads, and they access the same memory location, let's say the same variable, and at least one of them modifies that variable. And you don't do anything to protect that update. You just let it happen. When you have those three conditions, you have a data race. The bad thing about a data race is you get a silent data corruption. 
and those are a nightmare to, uh, to find. Uh, results are non-deterministic. You want to show it to some team member, and all of a sudden, everything looks well. So these are really the, I, I would think there's the most nasty bugs in shared memory programming. And even if you have an identical run, your results probably will vary. So here's the classical example of a, a data race. I have my variable, my shared var, and my shared var is used to add, to accumulate the values of a vector. Very simple summation. But I, I made it shared, so I, I'm meeting my three conditions. I have one variable, my shared var. All threads in that parallel region are reading and writing it, and I don't have any control to protect it from doing that in some sort of controlled way. So this is a classical example of a data race. So that shared was wrong. And I do have a data race, and I want to show you what happens. I ran this program 10 times, same program, and 10 times I get a different wrong result. Is that scary? Yeah, that's really scary, yeah. Is that real? That's real. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort of sell you OpenMP, so, but I do that in an honest way. So this is the, this is the difficult part of, of shared memory programming, and um, that's why we always hammer, hammer on tools to help us. And I must say, on the, in the area of data races, there's not so much help, unfortunately, while that is the hardest category that you can have, I think. Um, luckily, there's a fix. That's a good thing about OpenMP. OpenMP has fixes for about everything that I was showing, but you have to know about it. This is an example of what is called the reduction clause. You declare that variable to be part of a reduction, and that's a well-defined operation within OpenMP. This one qualifies as a reduction, so uh, I, I avoid the data rates. So again, data rates are very nasty. Uh, luckily, OpenMP has some ways around them. And use alternative, that's another thing that's also related to performance. There are some, some very, very efficient controls that help you avoid a data race, like atomic operation, critical regions, barriers, and locks. So think about that if you ever, ever go that way. I, I wanted to say a little bit about performance. That's just in the nature of the beast. So I focused on correctness so far. I want to say a little bit about performance here. Uh, the classical case of where op OpenMP doesn't scale is too much parallel overhead. You just blindly jammed in all those pragmas. The code will work, it's parallel, but you lose a tremendous amount of effic efficiency in doing so. And that is one of the reasons why in certain circles OpenMP has a bad reputation, like, ah, oh, that doesn't scale. Well, maybe, but there's a little bit more to the story. Um, and I, I could actually fill a whole talk with that, but I won't, I won't do that. Okay. Um, rule number one in OpenMP is make your parallel regions really large. Cram as much work into that one single parallel region as you can, and you immediately eliminate a lot of overhead. Load balancing is another one. OpenMP has some really nice controls to deal with unbalanced workloads, but not many people know it, and by default they get some static rigid scheduling, and there you go. Your, your performance is down the drain. Well, the fix, again, is, is usually pretty easy, but people just don't know. Uh, another one, there's a whole world in itself as well, a NUMA, non-uniform memory access. Um, not very well known outside some really specialized people here, is that OpenMP has really nice controls to deal with NUMA architectures in a very easy way. And that's a bit of a sales pitch, because you've got to know what you're doing. But once you know what you're doing, the control itself is easy. So you don't have to turn your code upside down to, to exploit NUMA in, uh, in at least some sort of way. So those are, that's about performance. That, those are three top reasons that I see why OpenMP uh, doesn't uh, perform very well. Uh, summary, I discovered some major mistakes made. Uh, they could happen to you too. They happen to me as well. Check for correctness. Uh, sometimes you see people, they start blindly paralyzing the code. And I'm sort of paranoid, but very often check the correctness of your results. Because when that happens after two weeks of work, it'll be much harder to find. So make sure you have that as part of your methodology. Um, the performance issue that I was showing, the tip of the iceberg, but it's a fairly big tip. And again, when you go, whatever you do with OpenMP, use a profiling tool to guide you. So first of all, you, you, you reduce the, the places where things can go wrong, and it'll make it easier for you to focus on performance. So that was it. Uh, final, final hobby horse. If somebody tells you OpenMP doesn't scale, just correct that person that says bad OpenMP does not scale. That's the message I'm trying to convey. Well, thank you very much. 
Uh, I think we have some time for questions, Nicholas. 